It's probably got a flash of thing that says I'm recording. You just have to hit OK. And we are going to start off because this series comes with a video DVD thing. And I'm lucky that my computer still has a DVD drive. So we're going to start off with the video. Um, give me just a second. Let me share my screen here. Cool. All right, can everybody see? Oh, where'd it go? All right, can everybody see a gray screen that says Power Media Player up at the top left? Yes. All right. Can everybody hear that music that just started? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, here we go. It's not easy to be a Christian, even if you are an avid reader of the Bible. And most people are not, we dare say. There's a big difference between reading and understanding. Hmm. The Christian faith has a lot of ground to cover. It spans thousands of years, including God's laws and the history of the Hebrew people. It tells of Jesus' ministry and our salvation through his death and resurrection. And there is virtually endless amounts of theology to wrestle with, stretching all the way back to the early church. And of course, there's your church's worship practices, traditions, and the sacraments. Somehow we're supposed to absorb all of that, organize it in a clear and meaningful way, and then apply it to our lives as Christians in the modern world. And on top of that, we're also charged with passing on this understanding to our families. Huh? That's a tall order and seems as though it would be very easy to get completely mixed up and lose our way. One might be tempted to decide it's easier to simply say that you are a Christian, go to church regularly, and then just leave it at that. That would simplify things. The good news is, this isn't a new problem. Hmm. Christians have been struggling with hmm. how to be Christian for a long time. Martin Luther grappled with it extensively. Hmm. During the Reformation movement, Luther observed people all over the country who claimed to be Christians, but had no idea what that meant. They could not recite basic prayers or explain central Christian beliefs. They did know that they should go to church, but that was not much help, as many of the priests did not seem to know much more than they did. Mm. Mm. Luther was also distressed to see his own theology, that we are justified by faith alone, was being used by priests to justify all sorts of abuse and liberties. Appalled by the state of things, Luther decided to tackle the problem head on the best way he knew how writing. But what could he possibly write that could cover all the essential doctrine, beliefs, and practices of the Christian faith using language that anyone can understand and could also be used at home? Why this little book here, The Small Catechism, written for everyone, including you. Yes, you, the people watching this video as part of a course on The Small Catechism. Welcome. All right. Looks like Gail is trying to come in now.
give her a second. What do you think about the video? It was cute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Easy to understand. Yeah. All right, so. Hi, Gail. All right, we will proceed and see what happens. Okay, so let's um, start talking about what we read here. Um, so the first section, they talked a lot about being a learner. Um, so a learner of the faith it dates all the way back to the early writings of the Bible, um, and especially is true in the ministry of Jesus. So being a disciple, uh, they went into the Latin, but I, the Greek is mathetes. Um, so, so being a follower of, of, right, is all about learning. So all the gospels refer to Jesus as 12 disciples or 12 followers as disciples, learners. Um, Matthew's gospel especially portrays Jesus as the perfect teacher, Right. He is the, the perfect rabbi, the, the one who interprets the law and brings righteousness to God's people, which is Matthew's thing. Every gospel writer has a thing, okay? Um, Luke's is social justice. Matthew's is righteousness. Mark's is um, we got to hurry up and tell this story right now. You need to know. And John is this already happened. We're going to get interesting with it. Um. So yeah, every, every gospel writer has a thing. Um, so Jesus sought to form his followers to be like him, right? Um, to be trained for the kingdom and, and to carry on the work of teaching others. But at the same time, he wanted them to remain followers, or they remained followers. He didn't want them to, but they remained followers of little faith, right? How many times do we hear Jesus say, oh, ye of little faith? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, lots. Um, and they struggled with doubts and needed regular forgiveness. Sound familiar? Um, and yet these struggling doubters were nonetheless the salt of the earth, right? They were the light of the world. They were the rock on which Jesus' church was going to be built. So we have... From the very beginning of the Bible and from the, the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, this idea of people who are learners, who are going to go out and teach, but who are imperfect disciples. There's always going to be opportunities for us to improve and for us to learn more and to improve our faith. And so we teach what we can and learn where we don't know, right? All right. So for you, this is a question at large, all right? What does it mean to think of yourself as a learner of Jesus and his teachings? Please, not aren't everyone we, at once. Aren't we always, <laughs> all, always learning? I mean... Yeah. Um, I think one of the things they're trying to push at with that question is, is it okay to make mistakes? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you learn. Did we ever see, did we ever see anybody? I mean, take Peter, for example. Okay, Peter was the master of getting things just right and then immediately putting his foot in his own mouth. But at no point did Jesus ever say, you know what? Enough's enough. You made too many mistakes. You're out. You're done. Okay. Uh, Paul, you know, as Saul is a persecutor of the, the faith and is on his way to Damascus to do some more persecuting. Um, when he gets struck down by a bright light and suddenly comes to realize that he's on the wrong track. You know, at no point does Jesus say, okay, 
you've made too many mistakes, you're done. Jesus says, this is the opportunity for you to get back on track. Um, so when we're lifelong learners of Jesus and his teachings, we're going to, to learn new things as we go through life. We're going to come to see things very differently over the course of our lives based on our experiences. We're going to make mistakes. And it's really helpful to have a reference point, something that's simple for us to hold on to. Because when we're in the middle of those mistakes and we're, we're questioning everything, it can be scary. You know, when you start questioning the things that you think you've built your faith on, then suddenly everything stops making sense. And what do you do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so besides being a person of faith, what does it mean to identify as someone committed to learning about that faith in a lifelong way? Do you ever stop learning? I hope you not. Shouldn't. <laughs> Is there any one right answer? It's always more than one side to an answer. See, the, the biggest reason the Lutheran Church still requires people to go to seminary is because there are a variety of ways of interpreting scripture. <clears throat> Most of the time, there are, I mean, there are some harmful ways out there. I, you know, people who twist the gospel into the prosperity gospel and, and say, send me your last $20 and you'll get a million dollars, right? You know, okay, yeah. those people are not, not helpful. Um, hi, Gail. Hey. <laughs> hey, we can hear her. Yeah. How are you tonight? Fine. Better late than never. That's all right. So we're just talking about the, the beginning of the, the uh, book, chapter one, and we're talking about being a lifelong learner. Um, so I was mentioning that, you know, the reason we go to seminary as pastors in a Lutheran church is because there are a variety of ways to interpret the Bible. There's no necessarily one right way to do it because passages can be understood in a variety of ways. There are harmful ways, you know, don't, don't do the prosperity gospel thing and, and all that, but there are a variety of ways to interpret things. That's why with like the Baptists, the Baptists think that with baptism, you need to make a decision before you're baptized. I can see their point. I, I can see what they, what they mean. I don't think we should stop doing infant baptisms um, but I understand why they believe what they believe. And I think it's based in scripture. So it's, it's an okay way to interpret that particular piece of scripture. It's not the way I interpret it, but it is okay. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. So surprise, but learning and education look different today than they did in Luther's day, right? You know, it was, Luther didn't have access to tablets or anything like that. Well, not electronic tablets. He may have had tablets of other things. <laughs> um, so a lot of learners today prefer to access things like multimedia and visual aids and lesson outlines and scheduled readings and learning goals. And, you know, when I was in seminary, we had a, an online service called Canvas where our professors would upload all of their stuff to it. And so I could always go and look at the outline for a lecture or, um, you know, see what the assignments coming up were with syllabus, <laughs> this, that, and the other. Um, and you got really used to that. And then you would run into a professor that didn't know how or didn't want to use Canvas. And you would be completely lost again. Because now you're back to the old way of doing things. And you've got to ask questions and talk to people. And that's a lot of yucky stuff. Okay. So um, in the early centuries... Learning happened mainly by telling and retelling, reading and rereading, hearing and rehearing. 
right? So there was memorization involved and there was repetition. We see this, the, the chapter pointed this out, that we see this a lot, especially in, in Paul's writings and in the gospels and stuff. There are passages that seem to be made and written specifically to be memorized and to, to be repeated over and over again as, as a way of proclaiming the faith. Um, there's an argument that that uh, Philippians three. Um, I have to look it up, but there's a, a section in Philippians that they argue is is probably originally a hymn that Paul incorporated into his letter um, because it it made his point and it it said what he wanted it to say, but also was a good way for the church in Philippi to remember what he was talking about because he was passing on the faith through it. Um, so memorization and recitation have kind of fallen out of favor in educational settings today, right? The teachers will say, we don't want students who can just repeat stuff back to us because they haven't learned it. They just learned to memorize. It. Um, and it's kind of happened that same way with the memorization of scripture and, and the basic teachings of faith. I remember there was a time when, when kids would have like memory verses and stuff in, in Sunday school where they would, you know, they're supposed to remember them and, and bring them back the next week, or sometimes even say them in front of church. Um, a lot of places don't do that anymore, mainly because it, produces a lot of social anxiety for children sometimes. Um, it's weird. I, they didn't care about that when I was younger. They just told me to get up there and talk, and now they can't stop me because I'm the pastor. <laughs> um, so because we've kind of moved away from this, we're, we're a little bit poor because of it, right? We, we don't memorize things the way we used to. Um, I told you before, I'm a cradle Lutheran. Um, so I've known the Lord's prayer for as long as I can remember. Uh, I, I remember learning it in Sunday school. Um, and I remember saying it in church, right? When I was a chaplain at the hospital, it was one of the prayers that I would go to because a lot of times people knew it, but you would be shocked how often people had no idea what it was. You know, you would find yourself being the only one saying, and it's it. It was a sign that you had not read the room correctly, and you did not know who you was you were speaking with because they didn't. They didn't know. Um, there are churches out there that don't use the Lord's Prayer because they don't believe. They, I mean, they see it in Scripture and they accept it in Scripture, but they don't believe that you should ever have a prayer that's written down. Um, that's very common in like the evangelical circles, like Pentecostal holiness and stuff like that. Um, they won't write prayers down. They believe if you're not praying spontaneously from the heart and from the spirit, then you're not properly praying. So a variety of point of views, right? Um, but because we've stopped with memorization, a lot of people don't know some of the basic stuff about the faith. Um, I even find it with the, the confession and forgiveness, right? For a long time, we used one, one version, okay? and I can still say it by heart because it came out of the green book and, and I know it really well. The ELW expanded that a little bit and gave us a few more options and then when Sundays and Seasons came out, which is the program that supports um, our bulletins and allows us to print everything in the bulletins, like the songs, they also came out with a guide that gave us alternate suggesting suggestions for the prayers of the people, for the offering and uh, communion prayers, and also for confession and forgiveness. And so we, we kind of change it up from time to time using those, right? Sometimes I have to rewrite them because sometimes they're not great. But, but there's something lost to me in being able to, to know that liturgy by heart and, and to be able to repeat it 
with or without, you know, the stuff in front of you. When, when the bishop, the last bishop, Bishop Yost, when he came down to St. Michael, when we were first talking about the partnership between Christ Community and St. Michael, he came down in February of 2020. And during that worship service, we, had, we were using setting three. And somehow, a musician we had over at St. Michael at the time flipped a page too many and got lost and just stopped playing during the glory to God because she didn't know where to go back to. And it's setting three, right? It's the old setting one from the green book. You know, most Lutherans know it. And so the congregation just kept right on. We sang it without music for the rest of it. And the bishop the bishop got up. He goes, yep, y'all are Lutherans. <laughs> you know? All right. So what faith teaching do you yourself repeat over and over again? What are some of the ones that are meaningful to you? The things you've memorized. The Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say, Judy? The Lord's Prayer, I say that morning and night. 23rd Psalms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although, on the note, on, on a, a, a small note about Psalm 23. The translation we have in the English is not very good. Mm. Really? I've written a sermon about that and preached it at a funeral once because somebody liked that. But um, just as an example, the the part where it, say, where it says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I should dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew actually says, Surely God's goodness and mercy will relentlessly pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall always dwell with my God. And the sense of it is, it doesn't matter if you try to reject God or if you try to turn your back on God, God will follow you all the days of your life, knocking on your door with the goodness and the mercy and going, here, have it, it's yours, take it, can't get away from it. Which I, I like that better. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of people look at Psalm 23 as a death psalm, but there's actually quite a bit of life to it um, when it's properly translated. So that's a rabbit hole, but an important one. Um, trying to think, there's, there's anything else that I've got memorized? One of the things that I have memorized, and it's a personal thing, and it's it's not it's liturgy. It's not necessarily biblical, though it's based on Bible stuff. It's uh, morning prayer. So the if you look in the red book, there's a, a service of morning prayer at Um and I will often use that at church when I'm by myself um, because I know the music so well that I can sing it and not have to have any accompaniment or anything. Um, not necessarily sing it well enough for the public, but still. Um, and it's one of the things that I do is kind of my devotions from time to time. Um, because it's, it's one of those services that I feel very close to. Um, but in fact, I think it was the first service that we, when you're in seminary, you have chapel every day. Um, but when I started at seminary, chapel was kind of open-ended. Um, each seminarian was assigned with another seminarian to come up with their own chapel service. And so it could be wildly different from one day to the next. But the, the week they taught us morning prayer, we did the same service every day. And I learned it very well. And... So from that point on, anytime they said, hey, Josh, we need you to lead chapel. It's like, all right, we're doing morning prayer. <laughs> all right. So questions so far or 
I'm trying to keep this based in what they said in the book. Um, kind of expand it out a little bit. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, so some of the earliest writings in the Hebrew scriptures, um, God's people are instructed to teach the basics of the faith to their children. So the book talked about this, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. The It's not pronounced Shema. I don't know why they put it in there. It's Shema. Because um, the transliteration in Hebrew is S-H-A-M-M-A-T um, with the T being silent. But um, Shema is the Hebrew word for, for listen or hear. Um, so it's a it's a command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God. The Lord is one. Okay. Um, so that passage literally instructs people to recite this basic creed to their children and to talk about the words when they're at home and when they're away and when they lie down and when they rise. Okay. And if you've ever seen like a, an Orthodox Jewish household, they'll have a little... Uh, it's called a mezuzah. It's a little round thing that's on the outside of their door. Um, and inside of there is a scroll that has Deuteronomy uh, 6, 4 through 9 on it. Because they were commanded to put it on their house and keep it amongst themselves. And so they keep it in a place where they have to walk by it. And everybody has to walk by it and see it on their way through the house. Um, I wish we had traditions like that in, in Christianity sometimes because it's such a visible and important reminder. I, I think that's one of the ones that they, they really have better than us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, where am I at? I got the stuff written now. Um, so the vision is one of, of anchoring faith in the home by reciting basic faith instructions in a, in a generational way, right? So family of all ages. The vision of parents teaching children, as Luther hoped with the small catechism, was not a Luther idea. It was an idea he appropriated from the history of the church, okay? Um, it, it's always been our history that we are to hand down the teachings of God to the next generation. That's, that's our responsibility to, to explain it the best we can and hand these teachings down. Um, it, so how do we today practice this idea of handing down the faith, um, especially at home? How did you all do that? in your families? Well, we always went to church on Sunday. Kids went to Sunday school. They went to vacation Bible school. We just centered the church around our daily lives. Okay. So um, church is definitely part of it, right? What about in your home life? What did you do specifically at home? We said bedtime. Yeah. Okay. What'd you say, Ch Debbie? I think it was Gail. Yeah, Gail? prayers at bedtime. Yeah, prayers at bedtime. Hmm. Now that's, that's the only thing I remember. I don't remember. I think they left the instructions. I don't. Maybe just the way they lived their life is my best example. Yeah. So a model of faith just based That's on how, how your parents right lived. my mother yeah rather than words it's the way she lived yes what about with your children <sighs> hmm. taking them to sunday school and to church reading bible stories in the evening at bedtime yeah. bedtime prayers We did with the grandkids. We did a lot of veggie tales. Yeah, veggie tales. <laughs> Explain that, Debbie. So I mean, those veggie tale songs. So veggie tales is 
uh, cartoon of anthropomorphized vegetables um, that not exclusively, but often spend their time talking about Bible stories and reenacting them in various ways. Um, some of them are, are really good. Um, like my favorite one is Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, but um, mm -hmm. personal reasons for that. Well, yeah, my grandson's name is Joshua. So that was the first one we got. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a kid show, but it's a, it's a pretty cool show. Um, matter of fact, I think Lexi has some Betty Tail books. Um, yeah. I, the reason I asked the question is because um, if you talk to people in my generation, so I am, however, regrettably uh, stuffed in with the millennials, just barely, um, but I am somehow included in that generation. Um, so people in the millennial generation and the, the generation after us, Gen Z or whatever they are, and then I think Lexi's generation is going to be like Generation Alpha or something. None of this stuff really matters. But um, <laughs> in any case, a lot of them will tell you that they did not hear a whole bunch of religious instruction in their homes. A lot of their parents relied on the church to do that teaching. And so you would have that one hour on a Sunday morning where you had church, assuming the kids got to stay in there the whole time, because that was not typically the tradition of most churches. Most churches hustled the kids out around the sermon time so that the parents could listen. And the kids went and did their own thing back there in children's church. In some places that went well. In some places it was slightly organized chaos. Um, I went to a church in which children's church was essentially the, the person who the adult took us up there and then disappeared and we did whatever we wanted to for 30 minutes until it was time to go back. Um, you know, and you, you, you pop back up for communion and, and then you went home. Um, and so a lot of people, excuse me, in my generation and, and later generations did not get the level of faith formation that earlier generations got because it was not something that was focused on all the time. And that is something that has shown up in the growing, well, in the shrinking of the church, right? People have fallen away because they don't have a faith background to, to fall back on. They don't understand why they should be a part of a church. Or if they do join a church, sometimes they join one that can be harmful and they get hurt by the church and then they don't want to be a part of it anymore. And if you're, if you're looking for some very vocal critics of Christianity, just look for some people who have been hurt by the church. They'll tell you exactly what they think. And it's really hard to refute their arguments because a lot of times they're right. You know, the church has done some bad things over the years as a whole. The church continues to do them in some places. Um, so, yeah, so so what we really need to push for, at least in our context, is a return to the basics, right? Mm -hmm. to, to making the stuff that's in the small catechism, like the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed, these basic tenets of our faith to making them so ubiquitous to us that they're just there in the back of our minds and we always remember them, okay? Because when we get to that point, then we start molding our faith life on those things. Does that make sense? And we pass it on to whatever captive grandchildren we may happen to have at any given time, right? I don't want to go to grandma's house. She keeps making me say the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> okay. 
So let's talk a little bit about Luther's explanations here. Um, Luther had this thing about explaining out whatever he was talking about. However, Luther's explanations will get really in depth and his explanations that he expands upon in the large catechism get even more so. So he does quite a bit on every single one of these things. Um, so the small catechism is not the first handbook of basic Christian teaching, right? Um, if, you, if you were reading in the chapter, they mentioned the Didache, which was an early teaching of the apostles. They mentioned um, the Enchiridion. I can never say that word. Enchiridion, that Augustine's book, which was essentially a catechism. Um, and there, there are others that have fallen or have gone through the, the ages. Even with monastic communities and with um, with convents. I kept wanting to call it a nunnery. It's not a nunnery. Um, but convents, the, the rule of life was essentially based in a catechetical teaching, right? Um, because there were certain things that you had to recite and do on a daily basis. Um, Judy, you might be familiar with this, but in the Catholic Church, they have something called the Liturgy of the Hours, um, which is a, a, a practice that evolved out of the monastic community. And it essentially involves, it involves a prayer service every three hours, 24 hours a day. Okay, so there's, there's one at midnight, there's one at 3 a.m., 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and on and on and on and on and on. And the reason is because the way the church is spread across the world, you virtually guarantee that at any moment, somebody somewhere in the world is praying. So the world is literally making a nonstop incessory prayer to God all hours of the day and night everywhere. Okay. Um, and that's a catechetical thing too. So based in a catechism kind of idea. So in Luther's day, there's renewed interest in teaching the catechism and his version really kind of cut to the heart of things, right? He was a lot shorter, which is rare for Luther. He liked to talk and write a lot. He even wrote down some of his dinner conversations. Um, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's recorded in the table talk, which fills like six volumes of Luther's works in the English editions. Yeah. So whoever published that thought a lot of themselves. Anyway, um, so making a summary of, of major topics um, is a popular thing, right? So, um, you know, the series like Piano for Dummies or, or Car Repair for Dummies, right? The, the whole Cliff Note series where they would purport to, to tell you all the important things about a book in just a small little thing, right? It never actually helped you in school, but you know, you know, supposedly it would. Um, so at, at some level, these have always been appreciated and used. Um, but what's the what's the special contribution to Christian belief from something like a religion for dummies kind of thing? Because okay, that's what the catechism is. That's what Luther's small catechism is. It's a small little book, and it's it's Lutheranism for people who don't know. So what's the benefit to that, do you think? I'll turn my volume down. It's a snapshot of the Lutheran faith. Yep. Yeah. And, and Christian faith overall, because right. most of the things that are in there, um, with the exception of, of conversations about the sacraments, um, that's where a lot of us Christians diverge. Um, but for the most part, everything that's in there is biblical or grounded in fairly universal theology. Mm -hmm. um, okay. 
so I had something else I wanted to say there. You're too young for that to happen. No, <laughs> I have the stuff written down and then I, I have other thoughts that happen. And then... That's your ADD kicking in. Yeah, maybe. Um, so we have this, this small book, right? It's that, that quick thing like Debbie was saying, an easy way. I, I know what it was. So one of the earliest ways of giving someone Christian faith or uh, passing on the faith was to hand them a copy of the Gospel of John. Hmm. Now, can you imagine you yourself having never heard anything about the faith? No idea who Jesus is. No idea about any of this. Someone hands you a copy of the Gospel of John and expects you to suddenly be able to, to live out that faith. That is the worst the only worst book than that for the faith might be Revelation. Okay. <laughs> if somebody gave me the gospel of John and said, here, this is what we believe. I'd be terrified because it's so out there at times. So having something like the small catechism that we can hand, put in people's hands and say, this is the faith. This is what our general beliefs are in an accessible way is an important thing because one, they can actually get something out of it. And two, it doesn't scare them away. Right. Because if you, if you give somebody something overly complicated, they're not going to take the time for that. You know, people don't like to do work. It's just the way it is. That's why the feel good churches are so popular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, even they, it's funny that even they have an understanding of law and gospel. They just have a reverse understanding. Um, so they use the gospel to get you in the door. But then as soon as you're there, then they hit you with the law. Oh, well, if you really want to be a Christian, you need to join this accountability group. And you need to be here on Wednesday night to do this. And you need to do that, this, that, and you know. And so and they get up there and they... They preach about, well, sometimes they preach forgiveness. Sometimes they preach crazy things. Um, and, and there's not a whole lot of substance there. And then people don't understand why the church is falling apart in places. One of the places we had to visit when I was in missions, my first year in seminary was New Spring. And we have a campus from New Spring right there by the church. Um, there are some things they are very good at. Okay, they are very good at organization. They are very good at at getting people into groups and doing small ministry and and being this mega power in the evangelical world. They even have a special I swear this is true. They even have a special scent that they created um, with Yankee Candle that is unique to them and is in all their campuses in the HVAC system so that when you walk into New Spring, it doesn't matter what town you walk into, it's going to smell exactly the same. Wow. Of course, they probably did have to do that because they took over a lot of old Kmarts and they all stunk. So there's that. <laughs> um, but they... We found very quickly that their theology is about as shallow as as you can get. Um, there, there's not a whole lot there for for people who are really hurting, um, which is sad because I think like the Lutheran Church offers quite a bit, but sometimes we scare people off with our liturgy. Um, Judy, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, um, what happened to, I don't know whether they're still doing it everywhere, but I really think that the Sunday school, that the children do learn a lot, of course, depending on who they have to guide them. Right. Even, I know I hated catechism, hated it, but I'll have to admit I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, I didn't think I did as a kid, but I did. Yeah. 
I mean, it depends on where you go. There's some Sunday school programs that are done really well. Um, there are some that are not. Um, so like when I, when I was doing my teaching parish work, my first two years of seminary was at Pisgah. And the, the person over Christian education there is a deacon named Deborah Poole. And Deborah is awesome. Okay, she is, she is over the lifelong faith formation committee for the South Carolina Senate. And she is, she is really good at this stuff. She knows how to talk to kids and, and teach them. And it's, it's a really good program because she's trained the people who are involved in it, right? Um, my internship congregation, on the other hand, was doing Sunday school the way they had been doing it since 1955 when they opened their, their education building. And as a matter of fact, one of the first things I did when I got there was throw away some of the Sunday school books that they had from 1955. Um, because they were like, no, we need to keep those. They're still relevant. No, they're not. Okay, the first chapter's on the Cold War. The Cold War's over. All right, we, it's time to move on. Um, but their Sunday school program was in bad shape because it was so rigid that the kids did not enjoy being there. They didn't learn anything. And there was no interconnection with other age groups. You know, you had a, a congregation that had a variety of ages and they all stayed in their separate areas and never really mingled together. Okay. Because even during church, there was a point in the service where the kids were evacuated from the sanctuary and went on to children's church for however long. We got them to stop that. And then they came up with the idea of taking the kids over to the chapel and having children's chapel, which would have been completely unsupervised by any pastoral leadership. And it was like, no, <laughs> no. So it depends on where you're at. Okay. Um, The way I personally lean is to have kids there with adults learning from each other um, as much as possible, which is one of the reasons we did the children's busy bag station. Um, you know, it's not to keep them busy. There are certain things in those bags that are meant to engage kids in the worship service so that they're paying attention because they're looking for those cues to light that electric candle to be part of the service or to hold on to that cross for the prayers or, you know, to, to bust out their children's Bible, to, to look at the pictures around the story we happen to be reading. They're engaged in the worship service. And if at some point they go back there to the back corner to that table and they make some noise and they draw some pictures, I don't care. Jesus doesn't care. Okay, the kids are there and they're learning something. If you make it uncomfortable for them and make it where they don't like it, then they don't want to come back. You know, now if they start turning over furniture and trying to light fires, that's probably where we draw the line. But even so, right? All right, so that's that's my soapbox for the evening. All right. We're going to skip a little bit of this because we're going to we're rapidly running out of time because I talk a lot. Um, so. So Luther envisioned that his small catechism would instruct children and adults, right? Um, not just a particular age, but it was supposed to be a lifelong practice which is why there's prayers in the back that, that cover everything from morning and night to meals and everything. Um, but Martin Booser, um, his vision of pairing the catechism study with, the, with confirmation is what kind of came to hold sway over Lutherans, right? So, you know, a lot of times we don't introduce the, the catechism to anybody until it's time for them to start confirmation. Um, what do you think it would look like if we went back to Luther's original practice and, and gave the catechism to kids and to families as soon as we could and encouraged them to use it 
in their daily devotional life. I know we used it as throughout all of our childhood. My grandparents gave us our first small catechism um, and, and we used it all the time. Sad to say, I did not carry that on with my children though. Well, I mean, I'm a pastor and Lexi's never looked at a small catechism. So. <laughs> I could fix that though. Lexi, come here. <laughs> there you go. There's a small catechism. <laughs> so I, I you know what I think it was before the days of TV in the games, video games and all that. I don't think True. to look at it the same way, Debbie. Yeah. There's too much of the outside world competing. I agree. I see it with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the parents' fault? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. And grandparents' fault. <laughs> I'm not sure that it's so much something that, that needs assigning blame so much as it is an opportunity, right? So the outside world intrudes into a lot of things. The, the idea for us, let me, let me back up a little bit. My personal view on scripture is that everything in it is about this wild reimagining of the world around us. Okay. Um, this, this, turning everything on its ear okay so instead of the world hierarchy that we have where the rich are at the top and the poor are at the bottom you know god's ministry has always been about lifting up the poor and and bringing them up right so everything's topsy-turvy everything's flipped on its head whatever you think you know is actually backwards the whole nine yards right so if the world's intruding the Christian perspective of that would be it's an opportunity, not a problem, okay, to figure out how to make the stuff that we're teaching relevant to that intruding world, okay, to show kids why it's important to know this stuff in addition to all the other stuff that they're going to learn, okay, and why it will be important later to give them a firm foundation and something to believe in. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Do you have the handbook on it? Catechism. Not at all. <laughs> okay. All right. So when we did our first meeting, we talked a little bit about uh, the introduction to Luther's small catechism, right? Where he um, calls people uh, simple cattle or rational pigs and a variety of other fun words. Um, so he wrote the small catechism, not just because of a request from a person, but because of this lack of learning that he encountered, right? Um, they went around to different churches throughout Saxony. They found a lot of problems with pastors and with, with laity. And so he took on this project as a, essentially a labor of love. Um, what do you think Luther would think of Lutheran churches now? I think he'd probably be nailing some more theses on some doors. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I hope he wouldn't do it to our doors. Those doors are probably the only good bit of wood we have left in that building. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only wood the termites haven't eaten yet. Um, but... Yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're right. I think he would have quite a lot to say. Um, I think 
if you if you think back to Luther's day, right? Travel's not easy. Okay, it's not you. If you were going to go visit the churches in Saxony, you weren't going to jump in your BMW and ride down the autobahn. Okay, it was going to involve walking or riding a horse through areas where you know there were no roads or there were hostile princes waiting to capture you and sell you to Rome because hey, it's Luther and we want him. Um, or, you know, people waiting to rob you because they got their robbery indulgence a couple weeks ago, you know. So it wasn't an easy journey. But Luther went on these visitations because he thought it was important. Um, he really very much valued that early Christian instruction and that basic Christian instruction. I, I don't think that legacy has continued very well. Do you? So the question for us is how do we get it back? How do we change that conversation and make it an important part of who we are and what we do? I think by doing what we're doing right now is revisiting it, taking the time to, you know, open, open it with an open heart and an open mind and um, learn it like a child. Yeah. So I agree. I think the problem with any Bible study or any small group within a congregation is you're going to attract the same people, right? People who are generally involved in the life of the congregation and who I can generally count on to show up to things, okay? The question becomes for us, how do we then, as that group of people, take what we learn here and give it out to the people who are not going to come to this kind of thing, who are consistently on the margin to the church? Because if we want to be that faith community that's grounded in these basic teachings, it can't just be a few of us who are. It has to be a congregational thing, right? It has to be something that we make a big deal about and that we try to help others who might be kind of usually on the outskirts come in a little bit to, to be a part of this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have any ideas for how to do that, I'm, I'm here all week. I think we're we are right now I mean that by reaching out into the community they see what we're doing and hopefully somebody's going to realize well maybe I I should be part of this that's what I'm hoping I, I don't know how else to do it you can't um, I don't think um I think just by the way we lived our lives and how we're trying to help others and people I think basically are good I really do. I think the majority of people are good in a thing. Well, you can see it by the stuff that's dropped off at our door. They might not come to church, but they're showing where their heart is. Now, if we could just get them through the doors, it would help. <laughs> um, let's see. So a key characteristic in the small catechism is the question answer format, right? Um, following up faith statements with questions like, what does this mean? Or that kind of thing. Um, so Luther wanted the small catechism to be interactive. He wanted it to be a conversation that you were having with yourself. And I, I can tell you from having gone back through it, even now as I'm preparing these sessions, given the two-year time since I led this study with a different book, um, at St. Michael, even some of Luther's explanations hit me a little different as I'm reading them now, because I've gone through different experiences over the last two years, okay? So there's this constant interaction throughout life. What you read today, just like with scripture, is going to be a little bit different than what you read and interpret in a few years, because your life has changed, right? Um. So since Luther designed it to engage people in an interactive way, um, how do we carry on that same vision today with those basic teachings? Um, 
how do we learn from Luther's approach and, and replicate new ways of doing this in the church? Do you think by having some kind of activity that will draw in people, we'll say in our, in, in our area or some, something that we could have where just so they could get to know us or we know them? Well, I think kind of what you were talking about earlier is, is the direction we want to go. So we want people to come because they found out who we are, right? By our actions. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like we want people to be interested in, in the faith because of what we do, right? So to get there, we need to make these basic teachings in the small catechism the basis for everything we do within the church. Okay, so... Um, as we go through here and we get to understand Luther's explanation of the Ten Commandments, we would really want to concentrate on putting those understandings into practice, okay, and living out what Luther's saying there. And I'll, I'll just give you a brief example. So when we get to the Eighth Commandment, which is, um, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, I think, or maybe covet. Well, in any case, Luther says it's not just enough to not do that, but you must, in every instance, look at your neighbor and try to imagine their actions being based in the best of intentions, okay? So the, the silly example I've used before is if your neighbor comes over to your garage and takes your rake without talking to you, your neighbor from a Christian perspective, has not stolen your rake. Your neighbor has borrowed their your rake because they had a desperate need to rake something in their yard and you had something they could use and they just did not have time to talk to you about it. Okay, and that's the position you should hold until you have a conversation with that neighbor and find out that they have decided not to give you the rake back. Um, in which case you must say, okay, they obviously need this rake more than I do. Okay. So you make it sound so easy. Well, it's not <laughs> right. It's, it's really hard. Okay. Um, I was listening to a story on NPR today talking about uh, homeless camps, right. Which are on the rise because the economy is difficult and the pandemic and everything else. And people being very convinced that, that tent cities increase crime. And to some degree they do, you know, you're going to have people who are in desperate situations who are looking to, to help themselves. And so shoplifting goes up and property crimes and stuff. The unhelpful response is people who get their stuff stolen and have electronic trackers who then go vigilante and roll up into the homeless camps trying to bust their stuff back out and end up in fights with people, sometimes even killing them. Um, the Christian perspective from Luther's understanding of the Eighth Commandment is to say, I had this thing. This person is homeless. They might need it more than me. And let it be. It's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's against everything the world teaches us to do. Okay. But it is the Christian perspective as Luther understands it. So, using that whole little series as an example, what we want to do as a church is to apply these teachings that are in the small catechism to our lives and try to live that way. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up. We're going to get angry. We're going to do all of that, okay? When I preach a sermon, nine times out of ten, I am preaching as much to myself as I am to you, okay? Okay? It's stuff that I need to hear too. And a lot of times it's stuff that I'm guilty of. And that's why I'm preaching about it. Um, because I need to hear it out loud. Because I, I'm not going to change on my own. But it's the effort that we make that makes a difference. 
We're never going to be perfect. We don't need to be perfect. That's the whole reason Jesus came. Okay? If we could be perfect, Jesus would have never had to hang out on a cross. The only thing we can do is try. And we do that out of thankfulness for what Jesus has already done for us. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So we're at 7-Eleven. Why don't we go ahead and, and end here for the night? Um, so I'm going to close with a prayer, but the prayer is actually from um, a mighty fortress is our God. Okay. So it's basically the, the verses. So any questions before we, we close out anything I've made less clear or confusing? No. Okay. All right. If you think of anything before next week, let me know, tell me on Sunday, preferably not before the service because that throws me off. Um, but, you know, let me know, send me an email, text me, call me, smoke signals, whatever. Um, but, you know, this, I want this to be a conversation and, and open learning. So if you have questions, ask, because that's important. That's how we learn. And odds are, if you have the question, everybody else has the question too. They just haven't wanted to ask it yet. Okay. All right. The Lord be with you. Also with and you. also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised us that you are a mighty fortress, a sword and shield victorious, that you break the cruel oppressor's rod and win salvation glorious, that the old satanic foe has sworn to work us woe. With craft and dreadful might, he arms himself to fight, but on earth he has no equal. We know that your word forever shall abide. No thanks to foes who fear it. For we know that you fight by our side with weapons of the spirit. Were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom has been promised to us forever. Thank you for giving us these gifts. Your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. And.